<laughs> What's real funny, she does sign language to me sometimes. I'm like, I don't speak sign language. She's like, oh, okay, nothing. So praise the Lord. Now, Brother Cordo, he can do, he does sign language with his wife. They can spell stuff out to each other. Kara taught me the alphabet several years ago, and that was interesting. I mean, I, I think I've told this story before, but uh, there's, there's the, the Spanish lady that lives right next door. Uh, been there nine years. Very nice lady, man. I, I, I mean, we're like, we're like good friends, but we don't. She speaks no English. I speak no Spanish. But I say "Como esta?" and she says "Something back," and it's "Muy bien" or "Bien" or something. But uh, anyway, so when we first moved here, we didn't. They they gave us a ticket. Listen to this. We put our trash out early, and they gave us a ticket. <laughs> that hilarious or what i mean look around the neighborhood they get they they walk past garbage to give my bag a ticket and so i thought well maybe we put it on the wrong day so i go over to her and uh and i'm asking her what day is the the trash go out and she goes no 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 and i go oh she's deaf so i'm like spelling trash out to her and she goes no hablo inglés i'm like all right, well, I guess this means nothing to you, so have a good day. So then I lost my confidence and gave up sign language. It was, it was such a traumatic event, I just stopped doing it. And so you know, sometimes that happens. Something goes down in your life, and you're not able to recover from it. I never recovered, so I don't do sign language now. And so praise the Lord. Let's take our Bibles and turn anywhere and get into God here. Uh, did I gaff? Oh, okay. Huh? Oh, nice. Well, I didn't do that. David Lugo? <laughs> so they, Paul said they knocked on the door, and uh, the lady was blind, and David said, tell her we got sign language. Hey, we not only got sign language, we got sign language for the blind. I know that one. So if you ever get any blind people that need sign interpreter, a sign language interpreter, you ask me. I can do it. Amen. You got to love David. David's not even here. We're making fun of him. Sorry, David. That was Brother Paul and your mom. All right, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And then if you find your place there, would you please stand and honor the reading of the word? If, I don't know what that is. Uh, if you, uh, all right, I just broke that, so. Find your place there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Let's all stand. If you need a Bible, there are Bibles there in the pew in front of you. And so please look on with us. Uh, and then if you need a Bible, don't own a Bible, always want to make sure you understand we'll give you one after the service. Love for you to have the Word of God. It'll change your life, folks. It's something you don't understand until you get saved and then you start reading it. Because the Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. So a person that's not saved doesn't receive the things of the Spirit when they read it. It's just like boring and you don't understand it. And, but when you get saved and you start reading it, not all of it. There are places in here that still confuse me. Uh, uh, you know, Book of Job is a confusing book to me. I like to listen to the Book of Job because they start talking, his friends and so many people are saying stuff that I get confused. But I didn't, I, I'm going to put it back on. I broke the thing. Uh, but anyways, uh, but the Bible will change your life if you let it change your life. And you ask God before you read it to change your life. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Let's look at verse number 11. We're going to read down to the end of the chapter. Verse number 11, the Bible says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. 
For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Let's pray and we'll, we'll have a song. We'll come back and preach to you just for a little bit. And if you're here and you're saying, I didn't really understand a lot of that in the beginning. That's why we have preaching. Uh, because God will has, has, has helped me and the Holy Spirit, and I've spent hours in this, just looking at stuff, trying to make sure I could convey it over to you. But the Holy Spirit will do that for you today, and he'll help you because there's a message in here. There's several messages in here. Uh, but God wants to help us as a church and help you as an individual. And, and God will do that if you'll let him. And so why don't you pray as I pray, God, speak to me. I need something from your word. Listen, folks, we all desperately need something from his word every time it's open. And God can do that for us, whether it be, and some of us will get completely different stuff than what I'll be talking about, but God will use his word to trigger and to, to help and to console and to comfort. There's so many things he can do with his word. And so that's what we trust. So let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the word of God. Lord, I do pray that you'd have your will and way in the preaching and teaching of your word. I pray that you would use me as a vessel. I pray that you forgive me of my sins and help me to get close to you and help me to be close to you, Lord, that you could speak through us. And Father, I pray for each person in this room, whether they be folks that have never trusted you as their Savior or they're folks that have trusted you as their Savior. I pray that you'd speak to all of us. And draw us where you have us to be and bring us where you want us to be. And may we make a decision that would glorify you. Would you please help us, God, in an amazing way. Do your work that only you can do. And I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing.
that's amazing. Uh, and that, that is all Bible right there. That isn't our Lisa's opinion or something she just wanted to say. Uh, that is the word of God. The Lord tells us that, that his righteousness is given to us when we get saved. When we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we get the righteousness of his perfect son. And, and that's wonderful. And, and, and God looks down and sees Jesus when he sees me. He said, well, how does that work? Uh, it works just like the Bible says it works. And God's God and we're not. Amen. And, uh, and his ways are not our ways. And if, if it was, we'd be in trouble. If I, if, if I was God, imagine that my, me being directed and being God. I mean, it'd be, it'd be crazy. Or you. I mean, it just wouldn't work. But God has another plan. And, and it's mercy and grace. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful he's all truth, too. But, but you know what? He's, he's wonderful, and he's a great mixture of all of them and loves us. And I'm glad that I don't have to pay for my sins that Jesus Christ paid for them. Uh, amen. That's okay. Uh, he, he paid for them, and, I, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to think about. I don't have to go to hell. I don't have to pay for them. I don't have to do anything. God did it all. Amen. amen. It's a done religion. And I thank God for that. And so, Galatia, or I'm sorry, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 uh, we're looking at it, and, and in the beginning, it may seem a little bit confusing, but I want to I want to get you somewhere today. I want you to see a few things in this passage, and I've got some points. I may not make them, may make them. I'm not sure what the Lord wants to do here today, but I know He wants to do something. And as I was reading my Bible, uh, I believe it was last week, I was reading through this and just... God just caught my attention. I said, I want to get back to that. I want to get back and study that some more. So God's been real good to me lately. Uh, he's always been good to me, but I've, I've been able to uh, walk with him a little bit and see more of him and, and his word. And so I want to help you today. I want you to see just a few things. In verse number 11, the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians. And he's speaking to the Corinthian church. He's speaking to these folks that lived in the city of Corinth, a big, big city, a wicked city. Lots going on in that city, but people had gotten saved when the Apostle Paul started the church. And we know that the church was pastored by more than the Apostle Paul. We know that Peter for a time pastored the church. We know that Apollos at a time pastored the church, and then others would pastor after that. But we know that the, the church was a good church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says they came behind nobody in gifts. They were second to none in gifts, which meant they were very, very good at doing the work of God. But then Paul would tell them how they were babies in Christ. They were, they were small Christians and unspiritual. And through the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is helping them and, and, and teaching them where they're wrong and telling them where to get right. And then we get in the book of 2 Corinthians, and he does some of that still, but and he really is going to start nailing down some things for the church and things they're supposed to be. Now, as the Apostle Paul is teaching the Corinthian church with a letter, there are people at the Corinthian church that are preachers, so-called preachers probably, and they look right on the outside. They are uh, 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 saying things that seem right, and they're contradicting the Apostle Paul and what he's telling the Corinthian church. And so in this part of the letter, we'll see some of this because Paul is talking to them, and he says this in verse number 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now that we right there is the Apostle Paul and the Apostles. We persuade men. He's drawing a picture of who he is as a minister and what he does. He, he persuades men, the apostles that are with him. They persuade men. They, they know the right thing to do. They're trying to see people get saved. And he says, but we are made manifest unto God. God sees us. God knows that we're doing this and we're persuading men. And look what it says. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. And so Paul is telling that Corinthian church, listen, God is using me and the apostles. And we're out winning people to Christ. We're persuading men because we know the terror of the Lord. God is going to come back one day. And he's not going to, he's not going to come back as a little lamb when he came the first time. He's coming back as a lion this time. And he's going to crush the world, literally. And, and so we're out persuading men. And he says, and I think that you guys know in your consciences that what I'm talking about is true. 
So he's telling the Corinthian church because there are some men there telling them it's not true that the Apostle Paul has all this learning and because he can speak with these different tongues and all this stuff, he, he's just acting is what they're telling him. And you're going to see that here in just a second. Look at verse number 12. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them that glory in appearance and not in heart. So Paul says, I don't need to sit here and tell you how, uh, how what I'm doing is right because you know me. I started that church and we were winning people to Christ and we still win people to Christ. And I don't need to tell you what's going on, but I want you to be able to go and tell those men that, that think they know what's going on, but really they don't. They're just glorying in appearances and their hearts are messed up. That's what he's telling them there. He said, these guys don't know anything. They just act like they do. They're, they're, they're into the tongue talking and, in, and into uh, speaking different languages, and they're into to, to acting like they're ministers, but their hearts are all messed up. And now I want you to understand this now. Well, this is the local New Testament church. It's a body of born-again believers that have come together to, to, uh, to, to, to obey the Great Commission and win people to Christ. But there are many churches out there or so-called churches that are not doing that. I preach in some of them sometimes. I get up and allude to soul winning and say that on Saturday I would go out and knock on doors and the preacher will later tell me, well, brother, we really don't do that here. And I'll think, well, he flew me all the way in to preach, so that's fine. I'll just keep preaching. But listen to me. When they're not persuading men and women about the terror of the Lord, it's not much of a church. And so Paul was telling these guys, the Corinthian church, you guys know me because we persuade men about the terror of the Lord. And these other guys, they're phonies. They glory in appearance. Their hearts are messed up. They're not doing the right thing. Listen, I thank God we have a church. Now, not all of you come out on soul winning, but you should. You ought to be out there knocking on doors, telling people about Christ, and be a witness to somebody, and be a real witness to somebody. And, and, and that's what the church is. It's made up of people comprised of people that have come together to do what God wants us to do and to obey him. Now it says, verse 13, obviously these men were saying that Paul was crazy. They were saying, you know, the apostle Paul, he was crazy. He spoke in all those tongues and he could speak these languages and da-da-da-da-da, but he, wasn't, he, he was out of his mind telling you guys this stuff and this stuff. He said, well, what, was he, what were they telling him? Well, I could go back and, and start researching Corinthians and see some of these things they were saying, but it's not important. What, I mean, what is important is that we know the truth, and when a person tells us it's not the truth, we have to realize that we know it's the truth, and pastor isn't crazy, because they're saying, you know, the apostle Paul is crazy, and he found out about it, and so look what he says. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is of God. Beside ourselves gives the connotation that he was out of his mind. And where would he get that from? It just seems like he just brought that up. No, no, he got that because there were men and women telling these believers that Paul was wrong. Now listen to me, folks. You can just turn on the television and they're going to contradict what your pastor tells you. They're going to contradict what this King James Bible tells you. They're going to contradict it all. And we have to know that pastor is not beside himself. He, he might be out of his mind in certain areas. And I have no problem with that. But I'm not out of my mind when it comes to this Bible. And I'm not out of mind when it comes to the word of God and what God wants us to do. And I'm ever learning it and wanting to learn it more and more. And so he says, we're not beside ourselves. If we are, we're beside ourselves to God. And then he says, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. So they think I'm crazy, but I'm crazy about the Lord. And when I come to you, I have a straight mind. I have my thoughts together. I am grounded, and it's for your cause that you get it from me being sober-minded and so that you can get the word of God. Everybody with me so far? Then he says this. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Who's he talking about? The, him and the apostles. He's still using them. The love of Christ constraineth us. 
That word constraint, I learned it years ago, man. What a wonderful, wonderful word. And the best way I can explain it is the way I've always explained it. If you've ever seen, and, and I know there's a chance we may not ever see them, sunflowers. They have a, a brown middle, very dark brown middle, and yellow uh, outsides like this. And a sunflower will move throughout the day. Well, where does it move? Wherever the sun goes, that's where it moves. Just like that dragon lilies, I bought them for my wife years ago when we lived in Arkansas, and those dragon lilies would point to the window. They would turn themselves. And that's what constrain is. The love of Christ constraineth us. Hey, listen, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We're not out of our minds. It's the love. God that's constraining us to do what we do. People might say, hey, you guys aren't that place. I've been called a cult. Not here. But in Arkansas, they would think we're going to the cult. Why? Because we want to live a holy, separated life for God. And that's not cultish. That's called Bible. And God wants that. And so the love of him is not what, I might be crazy, but I'm crazy for God. And his love is constraining me to be like him, to want to please him. And so I'm controlled by God. I'm constrained by God. And then he says, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. When he says that, it's a very interesting statement. We thus judge, which means this. Because we seeked it out and we understand that since Jesus Christ died for us, we're all dead. Let me say this. I wrote this in my Bible, and it's a very, very good statement. He not only died for me, he died as me. He took my sin. He didn't just die for me. He died as me. When he died, we died. When he buried, we were buried. When he rose again, we rose again. And he died for me. And because he died for all, then we're all dead. Hey, no matter what those naysayers outside are saying about the church, hey, no matter what they're saying about it, God's love constrains me because he died for me. And because he died for me, I'm dying with him because he died and I died at the same time. He gave his life for me. I'm a dead person. I, I, I want to be dead to the world. I'm not always dead to the world. I struggle with that just like any human being does on the face of the earth. But I want to live for him. Why? Because his love. He came and got me. He came and got me. Not only he came and got me. He's done so much. Gives me a, a wonderful church, a wonderful family. A, a, a just, there's so much to be thankful for. And his love is unlike anybody's love. Kara loves me a lot, but her love ain't like God's love. I mean, it just ain't. And it, it, it's second, but it's not even a close second. God's love gets me out of bed. God's love makes me say, I don't want to do that. God's love makes me want to turn that off. God's love makes me want to tell people about Christ and, and to stop with the old beggar on the street and talk to him and ask him why and then try to help him. Why? Because he... I know the terror of the Lord, man, and we need to see people saved. God put us here to not sit sour and sulk. God put us here to persuade men. And that is the local New Testament church's job. It is not to sit out and say hallelujah 8,500 times in a night. It is not to go around and knock doors so that I can be a part of 144,000 people that get to go to heaven like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. It is not the Mormons that believe that when we die, we'll be given our own planet. I'll get my own women on that planet, and I will make babies and, and, and replenish the planet. I'll be a god. That's what the Mormons teach. No, no, the love of Christ constrains me. Because he loved me, and he came and got me. And then he says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them 
and rose again. I'm con controlled by God. That's what Paul was. Paul was constrained by God, but then Calvary's love was his motivation. Hey, listen to me. That, that verse is such a wonderful verse, and that he died for all. He died for all of us. Hey, listen, you know what the, the awesome thing about the Apostle Paul? Because when Paul got saved... He was on a road called the Damascus Road onto a place, onto a city to get people who were professing Christians and lock them up and bring them back and put them in prison and some of them would be killed. And Jesus came and got him on that road when he wasn't looking for God, when he didn't want God, when he wasn't interested in God, but he was thinking about him. And Jesus came and got him. And Paul gets to thinking about that, I'm sure, as he's writing this. And he died for all, even me. You, you know, Ito wasn't looking for God, but God came and got him. And years after he got saved, he wasn't looking for God no more. He was looking for a fix. And God came and met with him, and that's what constrains him. Not me, although I help to reiterate some of the things in the Bible for him and for you because I love you, but it ought to be that we do it because we love God. And we can teach you every doctrine in the Bible. I can teach you about the blood, and I can teach you about the second coming, I can teach you about uh, Jesus being our sacrifice, I can teach you all that stuff, but until you love him, it won't do any good. That's where we have to get our children, folks, or that are growing up. And my kids have all been in church since the day they were born. Dale waited a month because he was early. But the rest of them got in right away. And, and so my job is somehow to keep praying and to keep reiterating that, that daddy's right and that TV is wrong and that government is wrong and the outside is wrong, honey. We're right. We're on the winning side. God says it. No, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Don't believe them. I don't need to tell you how good daddy is. You ought to know it already. And, and listen to me. The love of Christ constrains us. And as Christians, sometimes we get far from the love of Christ. We don't even think about what he did for us. And we get in the nasty now and now. We get our eyes on this world, and, and, and it happens to all of us all the time. But if we just get focused on him, I know these, these old farmer illustrations aren't well taken here, but if you take a plow, and you have to plow like a mile long field. What they do is they look at the end of the field and keep their eyes there and drive it. They don't look down and try to drive it because if they do, they'll be zigging, zagging everywhere. They have to keep their eye up there on, keep our eyes on God and what he did and on Calvary. Because if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he died for Paul. He died for Ito. He died for, he died for Brother Paul. But Paul was just a, a kid growing up in church. But he was wicked and needed the Lord. And didn't get saved until like Daniel Waters at 19 years old or 18 years old in Bible college. And, and imagine growing up like that and missing it. Well, what happened is Paul one day discovered that Jesus gave his life for him and that he wanted to love him. That's called salvation. Yeah. Salvation isn't, man, I just don't want to go to hell and I want to pray that prayer. No, no, man, we ought to, we got to see the love of Christ constraineth us. Uh, Miss Lynn read it, and, and I, just, I was going to go write it down, but I, I'm glad I remembered it. And let me read it to you. Ephesians 3.19, what a, what a verse. What a verse. And to know the love of Christ with patch, which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Hey, the only way to be filled with all the goodness of God is to know the love of God that, that passes all knowledge, not the world's knowledge, not what they want, not what they tell us, not what they're understanding, but what he did for us. Paul said if he died for them or for one person, he died for everybody. And listen, we that live henceforth, he said, what does the word henceforth mean? I'm glad you asked. I wrote that down too. It's really good. No longer. 
from, from here on out, no longer, look what it says, and he died for all that they which live should no longer live unto themselves. We're not living for ourselves no more. He said, well, man, your life must be really boring. On the contrary, yeah, on. Uh, my life is doing real, real yeah. well. I'm really happy. I have joy. I snicker. <laughs> I mean, I just, it just when, you got, when you don't have Jesus, you don't snicker. I'm just telling you, well, with the snicker, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you ever just, <laughs> I mean, you don't do that without the joy of the Lord. It doesn't happen. Kara snickers too. We snicker at each other sometimes. It's the joy of the Lord in our lives. Not that we're more spiritual than anybody. We just have to find the joy of the Lord. And he says, from henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So Paul said, we're controlled, we're constrained, and Calvary's love does it. And I don't want to live for myself anymore. Verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. What does that mean exactly, Brother Burton? I'm glad you asked. Here's what it means. You know what the world thinks of Christ? They think of him as just a man that lived on this earth. It was something and it was great and they know nothing about him. <laughs> I don't know a man after the flesh. I know no man after the flesh henceforth no more. I just know the risen Savior that has the hand of God upon his life. And then him and God and the Holy Spirit are directing things and changing lives. I don't know the one that the world knows. I know the only one, the, the, the real Jesus. I know the one that changes lives. I know the one that meets with me. And even when I don't deserve to be met with, he comes and convicts and helps and loves and, and puts his hand on me. You see, no longer do... Uh, regard Christ uh, from a pure worldly point. That's what it says. We, we, we don't regard Christ from just what the world sees him. You, you, you know, they don't even believe in him. It's a joke. I like turning the news on yesterday, that pastor that was in jail in Turkey, maybe you don't know about him, got locked up a couple years in Turkey. Trump got him out, praise God. Guess what he did in the Oval Office? Got on his knees right next to Trump, put his hand on him. Trump bowed his head, and he prayed a wonderful, rich, Jesus-led prayer on him. Why? Because the love of Christ constrained that man while he was in jail. Then his wife started praying for him. And Donald Trump, I know he may be as wicked as everybody wants to think he is and all that stuff. But, man, something has happened yeah. in, in, to that man this lately. He's letting God all over the place and bows his head and has made some great statements about Jesus. Why? Because the love of Christ is constraining others. We're persuading men. He's surrounded by Mike Pence. The other day he was talking about everybody has vices. Everybody's had a, has done some really bad things. Then he says, except Mike Pence. And starts laughing. Everybody starts laughing. Why? Because his, his testimony has made a difference in his life. Hey, listen, do we know the Lord? Because our testimony ought to make a difference in the world. We're not serving the Jesus everybody else is serving. We from henceforth know no man in the flesh. It ain't, it ain't about the Jesus that walked around that they believe walked around. It's the one that we know walked around, the real God of glory, the one that has power and authority over everything. And until we accept what he did on the cross for us and get saved, all we can know is the one that was in the flesh. But once we accept that payment and that, that, that he paid the penalty for us, and once we bow our heads in contrition and ask God to save us and, and, and look to his love that he came and got me. Came, folks, I, can go, I, I can't get enough of going over it in my head. How he came to my house. How I'd come home every Tuesday night and this would be rolled up in my door with Brother Weedo's face on it. How I'd come home the next Tuesday night and it's rolled up. How that gospel track sat on my table day in and day out for four weeks with a beer sitting on it. How a Bible was given to me. How those boys came back to my house because Jake couldn't quit telling his daddy that I think he'll come, daddy. And Brother Weedo would come over by himself knocking on my door. Then he sent them boys over. And then I couldn't get it off my heart. 
And I got up that Sunday morning after being out all night with a man sleeping on my couch that I'm going to church and walked in there with flip-flops and a shorts and a tank top and earrings in my ear and thinking about my life being wrecked and God controlled me in the parking lot when I tried to drive out. God said, no, come in. I went in and he preached the shepherd's psalm, the, the sheep's psalm, whatever you want to call it, uh, Psalm 23. And I thought, man, and if you stay close to the shepherd, I'll never forget it, Brother Paul. They who get away from the shepherd will get eaten by the wolves. You've got to have a shepherd. Do you have a shepherd? And I thought, I've got no shepherd. And God constrained me, Brother Carlos, and I held on to that pew. And I thought, man, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And he bowed our heads, and it was dark, and, and, and it was almost a cloud was over that place that day. And I thought, man, I've got to have this. I want this. I want this. I didn't know he needed to be saved. I never even heard that. Walked down there and got born again. What happened, man? God came and got me. Amen. Love of Christ constrains me. I'll never forget that day. Seems like it was yesterday. I can see it as clear as yesterday. And I can't tell you what happened to me last week half the time. But I can see that day, and I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that Miss Virginia Williams, who's probably 98 years old right now, still alive, saying, uh, uh, just winking at me and loving on me t for 15 years ago. And Miss Nada Corley coming by, I'm going to pray for you and get a wife, a godly wife. And, 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 and the other brother, uh, uh, Bob Wells, standing up, let's pray for this brother to God to get on him on, a third, on Wednesday night. Let's pray that God touches this young Christian man, helps him. I mean, what, what a life. Love of Christ constrains me. Love of Christ should constrain all of us. God wants to do something. I'm, 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 I'm done. We ain't going to preach the rest, but I'll preach it maybe next week. But listen to me. And as a, I, this is not what I wanted to give you today, but I believe God did something here. Hey, listen to me. Does the love of Christ constrain you? Do you have a real view of who God is, or you just see the one in the picture with the long hair? And the little skinny arms, and the looks white with blue eyes. Or do you see the Savior of the world? That they're going to stand upon a mount, the, the Mount of Olives one day. And he's going to, going to clean house one day. And we're going to, some of us will be with him, I believe, on white horses. Man, I, I, I'm just telling you, I have to refocus every day. Because the world does eat at me too. How can we be right? Maybe wrong. I wonder about my kids as we sit around the morning table at my house and I give the devotion every day and I'm trying to persuade them. He's real, guys. He's real. I said, even at the school today, guys, there's going to be kids in your school. They're not going to believe he's real. But he's real. He's real, God. Let's be leaders for the Lord. He died for us. I mean, I tell you, there's just been glimpses of times when I thought, man, they're getting it. And there's been other times like they don't get it. And I just pray all the time, Lord, they don't have to be preachers. Dale ain't got to preach. I'm glad he surrendered his life to be a preacher and wants to be in the full-time ministry. And that would be my desire for all my kids because there ain't nothing like the ministry. Right. Ain't nothing like it. Getting to be, I mean, I get to do the greatest thing. I, I don't have a job, if you think about it. it just my job is worry a little bit and, but and I, I want them to know that God loves them. And, and so if, if the love of Christ constrained him, that was his bottom line there. Because I know they're saying stuff. And I know they, 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 they dress right and they think they're something, but they're not. I, you know, it, it drives me sick to drive past that Mormon temple downtown. I mean, how'd they get all that stinking money? Millions of dollars for that old building. Looks like it's been there forever. They just wanted to blend in with the city and make it look like that cult was there forever. How do they get all the money, God, and we don't? And God just said, don't take money. It takes my love to constrain. It takes my love for people to see it and be led by it. And henceforth, not living to themselves. It's not a boring life. I'm not telling you not to have hobbies. Have hobbies. I, you guys got to set bed and breakfast. I want to go and go skiing with my wife. Lisa's like, you go to ski? I'm like, yeah, I used to when I was younger. I'd love to go ski. She wants to learn how. And I want to do fun stuff. And I'm not going to be on the ski slope with tracks stuck to my forehead <laughs> trying to ski past people with tracks. <laughs> hey, tell you, Jesus, Jesus loves you. 
I was going to be skiing, trying to not break a leg, <laughs> snickering with my wife. And then maybe when I eat, I'll say, hey, you know, young lady, this, this God's got something. He sure loves you. And you give your life to him. Persuade men still. It isn't a life of we're always going to be in church. I wish we were always in church, although I think it would just grow old and we'd just get used to it. We get used to it enough just three times a week. But wherefore hence know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we know Christ after the flesh, yet know, now and henceforth know we him no more. He ain't the one that walked around here no more with a meek and mild manner healing people. He, he's the God of heaven. And I know he's God of heaven. Do you know it? Because the love of Christ will constrain you if you'll let it. Be controlled, be constrained, and let Calvary's love help you. And he wants to. The world's view is different. Paul said, But unto him which died for them and rose again. I'm not going to serve myself. I used to be selfish, now I want to serve Jesus. That was Paul. Transform lives are constrained by God. If you're not constrained, here's what the prayer is today. You ought to come down here. If God's not doing nothing for you right now in your life and you don't really understand it, you ought to come down and say, God, would you help me and constrain me with your love and help me to see what you are and who you are and what you've done and help me to get my life back on track and do something for you? Hey, we all, that is something we have to visit all the time. Because if we're not careful, we'll wake up with plans. And plan God right out of the day and not think about him. But if we wake up, put him in his right place, the king of glory, not the one that walked around here, but the one that doesn't live after the flesh no more. And we let God's love constrain us that we henceforth live no more to ourselves. That we make a decision that we're going to live for God. It doesn't make us boring. I don't want you ladies to put your hair in buns and have a skirt that drags the floor, wear no makeup. And I mean, that's not what Christian life is. Christian life is just making good decisions, living for the Lord and not being perverse and foul. You know how foul the world is right now? It's sick. You can't take your kids nowhere without hearing foulness. But we have God, and we're not of the world, but we have to live in the world. We don't have to isolate because we've got to persuade men and women about the terror of the Lord. God don't want us to isolate. And so we, we are going to be around it. But the love of Christ should constrain us. And, and when we get over here and Jesus is over here, it ought to be a turn. I want you, Lord. And if you don't have that today, you can have it. If you're in here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never been saved, you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. I'm talking real faith and trust. Faith means you give your life to him and he has it to do with what he wants. That's where we get mixed up on salvation. It ain't pray, take me to heaven when I die. No, putting your faith and trust in him means here's my life. Take me and have me, and I want to give it to you. Doesn't mean you won't take it back sometimes, because we often do. But the, the, the whole salvation has to come with a faith and trust in God, and that's it right there that day. I want you, God. Doesn't mean you're going to be there forever, because you're going to mess it up, quite possibly. But it does mean that you made a decision that day to put your faith and trust and really be in him, not to just a fire escape from hell. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heads bowed and eyes closed, and... Folks are coming, but maybe you're in here today with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe you're in here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That if you died right now, you're not sure that you would be sep wouldn't be separated from Him. The Bible says if, if He doesn't know you and you don't have Jesus, you'll be separated for all eternity. If you don't know Him, can I pray for you? Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me. I'm not sure that Jesus is my Savior Pray for me, preacher. Here's my hand. Anybody like that? Just slip it up right now. Just slip it up right now so we can see it. God bless you. Anybody else? Here's my hand, preacher. I'm not sure that Jesus is my Savior. I think he is. I'm 85% sure, but I'm not 100%. Would you pray for me? 